Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks Paul. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about detecting emer emergent phenomena in throughput data using FAST. We'll unpack that title as we go along. Uh, and it's straight work with my predecessor at Lawrence and also of course Idris. Um, just to introduce my, a bit about myself, as Paul said, I'm a research associate and second year PhD student. And my PhD title is Novel Methods for Detection of Emergent Phenomena in Streaming Data. So like Paul said, big focus on streaming data. In terms of my research interests, it includes anomaly detection, online change point detection, and then more mathy things like non-parametric stats and functional data analysis. Today I'm going to talk to you about FAST, and FAST sort of incorporates anomaly detection, online change point, and FDA. And we're going to look at how to detect anomalies in throughput data using it. Before I go into the talk in its full, well, I was going to say glory, but I guess we'll see, I'm going to talk a bit about the throughput data itself and just introduce that data to you, just so you've all got an idea of the sort of plane I'm talking on. So it's recorded at one minute intervals. This is at one point on the BT network. And if you were to just display it over the course of the year that I've got the data for as individual points each minute, you'd see it's just a colourful mess, OK? It's hard to pick out anything from that data in itself. However, if we look at it over time, we see there's a more or less a repeated shape between certain days. And of course, that's to be expected, isn't it? Because consumer behaviour is similar over certain days. So if I think about the, the middle of the night, there probably isn't loads of people streaming things. I think about the evenings after work or on a weekend, of course, usage is higher and therefore throughput data is higher. So our first thing is, as you want to just say, this throughput data has got a repeated shape and that's gonna, that repeated shape is going to form the very foundation of the fast idea. OK, in order to get that repeated shape a bit clearer, which you might have noticed, it's a bit, you know, noisy, there's some interference and so on. We're going to smooth the data so we've got a single curve for each day. And not only is this a mathematically useful representation of the data, that's the functional data aspect of this work. We've got curves for our observations. It's also a very convenient visual representation too, because this becomes that. And we can clearly see there's some repeated shape over the course of each day. It varies a little bit, but you get the idea. The trough in the middle of the night, the peak in the evening. If you want to look at it from a full perspective, that very colourful plot suddenly looks a bit more meaningful. We see we've got this general sort of structure. And then some days where it looks well, I mean, in that in particular has gone very wrong, hasn't it? And so we threw the data so we get this kind of structure that we can see there are some days where it's going wrong and plenty of days where it's going, I suppose, for lack of a better word, not wrong. And we're going to be working with this throughput data. OK, so. Just to introduce the problem to you, now we've seen the data. So as I've said, over the course of the day, the volume of throughput changes, but there's a repeated shape. Sometimes, however, there are deviations from said underlying shape, and they're going to indicate potential faults or outages on the network, or just unexpected customer behaviour. And we want to detect these in an online setting. We want to be getting them as soon as is practicable. We don't want to be, if it goes wrong at 10 past two, waiting until midnight the following day to say, look, something went wrong. It's pointless. As soon as it starts to go wrong, as soon as it emerges, we want to be capturing that anomalous behaviour. Just to really hit home with the picture, I've got a simulated example, just some curves there. You see there's a repeated shape. And if we had a new day that follows the profile, you see that here it starts to not follow the profile. And we'd want to be saying just after 10 o'clock, look, this doesn't look like it should do. Something is wrong. I don't need to observe the rest of the day to know that. I want to be getting it as soon as possible. Why solve this problem? What's the point? Why, why are we interested in this? Well, detecting faults or unplanned outages in real time allows us to try and fix them as soon as it's possible. And that's going to minimise the impact on the customer because we could be fixing it maybe even before they notice. And that's going to benefit the reputation and revenue of BT. Sort of as a competing sort of reason to solve it, modelling the surprising behaviour can help build models about the operation of the network and benefit future strategic planning. The analysis of data using something like FAST might reveal properties and things that are happening that you didn't know are happening, but need to be incorporated into sort of future strategic planning. And then finally, it is mathematically interesting. It's a quite a novel problem. It uses lots of different techniques. It's a cool thing to work on and it makes quite nice pictures. So all that together, uh, package it up as a worthwhile thing to work on. At least I think so. Hopefully um, you agree. And I suppose to answer a second question you might have is why do we need a new method? 
surely there's things that do this. I mean, I can see, you can see by eye sometimes it goes wrong, don't you? So you'd think it'd be easy to do. But at the minute, either existing methods don't deal with the kind of complex sort of moving shape of the behaviour that we see. Or if they do, they require the day to be observed in full. Remember, we didn't want to be finding out at midnight the following day it went wrong at 10 past two in the morning. It's pointless, 22 hours late. So we need a new method that actually can do it in an online fashion. And my method, our method, is going to overcome this by first modelling that underlying shape of the data. As I said, that's the foundation. And then we're going to take a new observation and we're going to compare it to the shape as it's observed. And in doing so, we're going to capture the anomalous phenomena as they emerge. So that's how it links to the title. So now I've just sort of introduced the data and the problem. And to let you know that in this presentation, I am going to, firstly, present the methodology behind the FAST algorithm, including, I'm afraid, some maths for those who are interested. And then I'm going to demonstrate FAST in action before providing an analysis of BT data using FAST. And then I'm going to deliver an update on where FAST is up to, both in terms of its implementation within BT and its academic life, its publication. And then I'm going to look at some extensions to FAST, including a multivariate forum where I look at a few different locations. And that'll sort of give you an insight into the what's next for me and my research question, if you were wondering it. So, first things first, the method. I've stressed, I mean, I've, I've probably started every slide, you're probably already sick of hearing it. It's all about this underlying shape for the data. And FAST compares a new day to the underlying shape of the typical day. So we want to capture that underlying shape in a single mathematical model. <clears throat> in order to do that, I'm going to fit a data-driven differential equation. So differential equations are going to describe that shape. And by data-driven, what I mean is, is I'm only going to use the data that's given to me. I'm not going to be doing any expensive physical modelling. I'm not going to try and understand the physics of the process. I'm going to be, it's a non-parametric method if you want the statistical terms, but I'm not going to be making assumptions. I'm going to be using the data I've got to fit a model, a differential equation to that data. And the advantage of that, of course, is it captures the time-based physical characteristics of the system based on what you've given me. You don't need to then go and do modelling at different locations for different models. We can just deploy it as it is to these different places on the network and we can crack on with it. There's no need to actually go and get the physical model and depend the process to be understood from like a physics point of view. In terms of the maths behind how I do this, so I've said I'm going to use an ODE for those interested. What I've got is I've got some curves. X, I, T. And that's basically saying on the i day at time T, what is the throughput? And to this set of curves, I'm going to fit an order M linear ordering differential equation, which looks like this. And this equation is a coefficient times by the derivative of the observation. Now, you may be thinking, this looks a lot like a line of best fit, the linear regression. And in all fairness, I don't want to sort of trivialise my research. This part is, rather than a line of best fit, it's a differential equation of best fit. And we use a technique called principal differential analysis to fit it by, just like in linear regression, minimising the residuals of the fit. For anyone wondering how I choose that value M, I do it using BIC. And in the paper, we show why that makes sense and how it sort of mathematically works on that sort of level. But that just gives you a bit of an idea and understanding of how I fit that ODE. And it really is, in terms of the computational sort of complexity, no harder than the linear regression. So it's very much an easily deployable, easily interpretable sort of piece of kit. Give you an example of what that might look like. Again, I've just got that simulated throughput, 100 days of it. And this would be what the solution, the model would be for that data. You see, it follows that profile nicely. It sort of tracks along and provides what I would say is a sensible fit. Now we've got that underlying shape captured, said it again. Uh, we're going to look at the, uh, how the anomaly detection test works. So this slide will give the informal idea, and the next slide, for those interested, the mathematical basis. So like I said before, we're going to compare a new day to the fitted model by looking at the residuals that we have left after applying the best fitting differential equation. So I fit my ODE, and I'm going to apply it to a new day, and that'll give me some leftovers, some residuals. I'm going to look at how, over time, these residuals change. I'm actually looking to look at the squared change, so it's all positive. I'm going to take the cumulative sum. And if the cumulative sum, by some time point, crosses the threshold, I'm going to say there's an anomalous behaviour present. So if you have heard of one before, it is just a variation of a Q sum test. I just take a cumulative sum of some quantity, and if it's big enough, 
are declaring a law. That threshold, and I'll show you the result for it in a moment, is actually set to control the probability of false alarms at some user-defined level. So if you only want a 5% chance of a false alarm by the end of the day, you can set the threshold to control that. Uh, and in terms of computational point of view, uh, once we fit the model and we're just running it on new days, that's a linear time test. So it very much is applicable in an online setting. There's no reason why you couldn't apply it. Mathematically, for those interested, a new observation looks like this x n plus 1 t. So we've got the first n days, we fit our ODE, here's the n plus 1 th day. We apply our ODE to the n plus 1 th day to get our residual. Now, in order to get that sort of cumulative sum over the course of the day, so we can detect the emergent phenomena, we're going to slice the day up into a fine grid of t points. And then when I say we're going to evaluate the residual squared one step change, that's what that looks like. And then when I talk about the cumulative sum of that, that's this. So I'm going to take the cumulative sum of the squared one step difference of our residual function for our new day. And if we cross a threshold, i.e. that sum is bigger than some value gamma, then we're going to declare an alarm. So that's how it looks from a mathematical point of view. And I suppose it's worth really hammering home. We only need to know up to the point we've seen to work out this test statistic. So we really can do it as the data is observed. We don't need to observe the full day, which is just what we were looking for. Perfect. Um, I suppose now, I mean, I think this gift's been uh, well run out over the course of the last few months, but just to reassure you again, we've got the training data, those first end days fitted there. We start observing a new day for fast, that green line there. It looks more or less like the others. We don't have a problem with it. A new day comes along and we see that towards the end of the day, it doesn't quite trail off as expected. So we say, hey, that's not right. There's an alarm. A third day comes along and fast doesn't see anything wrong with it. How do we? Follows the profile. Before a fourth day comes along, and we see it quickly dips away in the morning from that underlying shape and we declare an alarm quite quickly. So that's um, sort of an example of fast being run just on four days of simulated data with 30 days of training data. So that's sort of fast in action, if you will. Now, um, something I'd like to just pop in um, during any longer talk on fast is just a bit of the actual theory that we've got for fast. I'm not going to give it you in its full mathematical intensity because I've I don't like that either, but I just want to give you a brief interlude for a bit of mathematical theory to provide you some sort of confidence that this isn't just um, me selling some snake oil and there's actually some sort of concrete basis for this test. And when we devise an anomaly detection test, there's, I mean, there's several desirable mathematical properties, but I've just plucked out two that I think it'd be good to see. The first, as I've said before, is an ability to control the false alarm rate because we need some degree of confidence that the anomaly is not a mistake. And this gives us it, because I can physically control the probability of a mistake at some acceptable level. Obviously, the more controlled it is, the harder the detection is, because we lose power. But if you want a 0.001% chance of false alarm, so be it. The result I'm going to show you will give it you. And then the second one, and this, this is basically from the literature point of view, we call this an asymptotic power of one. But what that means is that the detection test would if left running on anomalous data forever, be certain to detect the anomaly. And that's not the case every detection test. There really are tests out there that you could run on data that was anomalous forever, and it wouldn't necessarily flag up that anomaly. So you can think of this property number two as eventually fast will see the anomaly. So I'll just show you the results we've got for them now. So the first, that's setting the test threshold to control false alarms, just lets you know that if this is, this is given in terms of the end of the day, so the probability that you will declare an alarm, given there's no anomaly, by the end of the day, can be controlled at less than some probability alpha if you set the threshold using this result. That's all it's saying. So this tells you a way for you to get a single number that gives you confidence that what you detect is going to be a false alarm to some probability that you want. It's a way of picking that and controlling that. So one single number, one single nice formula to give you what you're looking for, to give you that confidence. The second, the asymptotic power, again, don't worry about what it's saying, doesn't matter, it's just in its full details. It tells you that unless your anomaly is absolutely constant, you're guaranteed to detect it. So as long as there's some change over time, some little wiggle, some little movement, then we're guaranteed to detect it. And what's also nice is as a sort of a corollary result, this shows that if I run my, date, my test on data without an anomaly, it really could feasibly run forever. It's not guaranteed to stop. So we'll just keep seeing more data and more data 
and it won't fall over and go accidentally something's wrong. We still control it at that level alpha as we go to infinity. So now back away from the world of theoretical maths, we can go back into the real world insofar as um, telecommunications is the real world. And I'm going to present to you an application on some BT data. So we've got a part of the network called Collingdale, uh, measures a large amount of throughput data, and it's recorded every minute, just like in the example at the very start. What I'm going to do is I'm going to train fast on the data for January 2019. And then I'm going to use this to see what I can pick out in terms of anomalies between February and April 2019. So I train on January and then run on three more months. And I've set the threshold to control the false alarm rate at the 5% level. So we want, to, we want to only have 5% of the 89 tested days returned as false alarms and nothing anomalous is present. And indeed, that is what happens. It, it picks out five days. So five out of 89, about 5%. It picks out five days as being anomalous and they're, they're clearly not which is absolutely in line with what we expect. In terms of showing the training data, we see it's got that nice, smooth, underlying shape. And I pre-screened out this one with this weird spiky drop in red. Um, the reason being is because, ideally, FAST would like to be run on non-anomalous data. Okay, we want, we want to fit the right differential equation to describe that shape. So we don't want anomalies in there. And it's screened out by using FAST run on the data itself. Uh, I won't bore you in the slight mathematical details to change that, but you can use FAST on a full sample rather than new observations if you want to. And then we're going to run it on this data. And I mean, there are three very clear examples of anomaly. But we're going to run it on the rest to see what we pick out as well. But as you can see, there are three very dramatic anomalies. And so I think we'll start off with, we will, the detection of said dramatic anomalies. And I really want to focus on, I think I've shown this to a few people before, uh, this one here in red-ish because we see there's a little bit of weirdness happens in the hour or so running up to the dramatic anomaly and fast actually picks out this weirdness so it tells us there's something going to go wrong before it goes what i would describe as very wrong so this is just showing that sometimes the throughput data that we're monitoring can be sufficiently strange for us to almost anticipate what i describe as a big problem so that's quite a nice feature of fast is that it is quite sensitive to small deviations which can then, in the BT context, preempt larger problems. And we see detection of the two as well takes place while something is going wrong. Uh, and then again, we're focused on, I've called these, these are more examples of anomalies that I'm picking out because they're, they're harder to spot from the training data by eye. But we see as well here in this sort of burgundy colour, an example, we've barely gone wrong when we're saying, look, something's not right here. And we're really preempting this trough that the other two detect within their time. So yeah, again, what we're seeing is we're seeing that there's a chance that the data will be sufficiently weird before the anomaly for FAST to sort of preempt that problem. And that's going to give us the maximum sort of time we need to get engineers out to fix it or to get things set up to handle calls from customers who've lost the broadband, et cetera. Um, in terms of where FAST's up to, so that was very nice. That's a FAST example uh, on some sort of fixed BT data that was given um, 18 months ago or so. Faster draft paper awaiting submission. And in terms of reproducible software, it's also packaged in R as the package PDA fast. And that's going to go out when the fast paper does. So it's available in both software form and manuscript form. So that's its academic life. In terms of its non-academic life, it's BT implementation. I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about this in the next few slides, but it's basically in the process of being implemented on the VCDN server within BT and someone called Adam Broadbent. I think I talked about this a few weeks ago, the Impact Accelerator. Uh, someone called Adam Broadbent's helping us do that. Um, to give you some more details on that, I think it's quite an interesting thing to talk about. And this, this is definitely a simplified explanation. I should add in a little sort of caveat. I'm not a computer scientist and I don't claim to be. Um, so VCDN is basically a virtual cache on some BBC iPlay data that's being trialled within BT. And what we're doing is we're showing that FAST can be integrated into this cache network. We monitor it for anomalies. Not necessarily because we think there's going to be lots of anomalies, but as a proof of concept that FAST can be integrated in other places, like, for example, on the um, sort of the edge network on the throughput data platform. So that's the reason why we're doing this. It's sort of a proof of concept for the integration, whereas the previous example on the Collindale data was a proof of concept for the test itself. How it works is data is pulled from the cache network using InfluxDB and then gets pushed into a Docker container. 
inside this Docker, everything mathematical happens. OK, so I've been responsible for sort of the inside of the Docker and Adam's then sort of fit around the outside. Because inside the Docker, we process the data into the form we need. And then we use the R code for fast to analyze the data. And we just return a flag for when an anomaly is present or not. The reason this has been great is because fast relies on quite a few R libraries that would have been painstaking and time consuming to recreate in other languages. Not impossible, not impractical, just painstaking and time consuming. Okay. And so what we've done is we've got all that processing, all the lovely R code and all the statistical code we needed done in one place. And we've just integrated that as a Docker to the sort of the cache data network. And that's much easier than rewriting lots of statistical code in a language that's not as well designed for it. Perfect. So that's sort of a high level explanation of where the VCDN implementations come to. And nicely, because some work was done in it about a week ago, I think, a week, uh, more like two weeks now, um, I'm going to show you an example of it working on a single anomaly in the VCDN. So the VCDN data, it looks a bit different, I suppose, to the throughput data. But in principle, it's got the same sort of idea. We've got the trough in the middle of the night, building towards a peak in the evening. The only change is the middle of the day is not too high because I suppose people are working, not necessarily sat at home watching night play. What happened on a few weeks ago is some work was done. And so at 10 a.m., the cache was actually switched. Well, basically, it was switched off by 10 a.m. Okay, it was being the process of switching off. And so that we were able to run fast on a known example of an anomaly to say, look, at 10 a.m., it's going to start draining traffic out and then going wrong. Can we see this reflected in the data? Can fast detect it? And the answer was yes. By five past 10, which I think sounds really good, uh, within five minutes of it actually going into the going off phase, although we do see traffic draining up to the hour before, by the five past 10, five minutes after the work actually is sort of seen as starting, we're able to say, look, something's not right here. It's gone wrong. So although this wouldn't be of interest to detect from an anomaly point of view, because it's a known anomaly, it's reassuring to see that an implementation of FAST on actual BT data in an actual way is able to detect an actual anomaly. That's nice. It's a really nice proof of concept, I think, this. And it just shows, again, that it doesn't just work on the Collindale throughput data, but it works here too. It really does work in a breadth of locations. And what we're looking for is as long as we've got an underlying shape, the data set is a candidate for FAST. However, what I've just mentioned there is this idea of an underlying shape. And I've stressed it all the way through this single underlying shape for non anomalous data. And we've really focused on that. But as part of the academic sort of journey FAST has been on, you showcase fast working situations where perhaps the assumptions aren't quite met. That's sort of to show the robustness of the method, show it working in different places for interest as well. Like you want to know what breaks fast and what makes fast. And one of the places I've done it is when there's a bivariate underlying shape. So there's not just one underlying shape for the data, there's two underlying shapes. And it actually works in these cases too. I'm going to show you three different kinds of two underlying shapes that I mean in a second, some pictures, and I'm going to provide some comment about them. So the first one is this sort of a, a classic, easy to see. There's multiple underlying shapes. OK, there's two different bodies of curve there. The second one is when you've got the same underlying shape, but shifted up. So I've put multiple underlying magnitudes. This one's about one to two. This one's about nine or ten all the way through. I mean, this is hard to pick up my eye. I don't like this plot at all. I think it hurt my eyes. Uh, this is about multiple underlying frequencies. So it's the same sinusoidal curve, just with a different frequency. That's what we're seeing there. And so we've been able to show that FAST is able to detect anomalies with respect to either of the underlying shapes here. So what this illustrates, the reason I'm introducing this to you is because it shows how I've just gone and rambled on about the single underlying shape requirement. So you might be sat with similar data but multiple underlying shapes and thinking, well, FAST doesn't work. Can't use FAST here. What a shame. But it illustrates that actually a single underlying shape isn't necessarily a requirement. I don't want to say it's not a requirement because it will work best with a single underlying shape. It makes the most sense from a bi point of view. But it's not a requirement, as we've shown from those simulations. And what's really interesting from a mathematical point of view is that in the magnitude and frequency case, 
there's no one single ODE model that fits both of the sort of, I've called them modes, the two different shapes of the data in one. It's mathematically impossible, for example, to fit one model to this. What's happening though, is that the model we do fit still captures many of the dynamics of the data. For example, if we go back to the shape, the gradients are the same for both modes, aren't they? It's just the actual absolute value that's different. So the ODE model actually provides a flexible fit, capturing many of the dynamics of the data, i.e. the gradients, etc., or the higher level gradients. And that means that we're still capturing much of the underlying shape. We're still getting a good idea of what that model looks like. We've not just fit what we see, we're fitting the changes, the changes of the changes, etc. And so as a result, a non-detection is still possible. So I think that's a really nice thing to have shown. And it just shows that FAST can work in places that perhaps it wasn't expected to work in. Before we come to an end, what I also wanted to talk about is just one of the strands of my current research. And this is sort of ongoing, and I'm going to provide sort of a hint and a brief overview of how we're getting on with it. MV FAST, multivariate FAST. So FAST at the minute is monitoring one location on the BT network. And of course we could, if we wanted to, deploy it at lots of locations independently. And we could monitor them with lots of FASTs running on. But the thing is, is if I consider multiple locations independently, that might not be as good as considering them concurrently. That can obviously, looking at the data overlaid against each other, that can provide you greater insight because you can see more. But it can also, by considering the different locations together, enhance the detection power of the test. If you like informally, lots of little anomalies that aren't noticeable on their own could add up to one big anomaly that is noticeable over all the locations. Also, that ODE structure is going to capture links between the locations. It's going to capture correlations. If they're all going up and then one starts going down, perhaps that's a problem if we expect them all to increase in the first place. So it gives more context the behaviour we see. It can help you detect anomalies that are only anomalous in light of the behaviour of others, not necessarily the behaviour on its own. So that's why we want to run fast in a multivariate case rather than just in parallel independently on several different locations. One of the focuses of the work as well is to detect both dense anomalies, i.e. every location we look at anomalous, and sparse anomalies. So we're just a subset of the locations as anomalous. And just to help you visualise this, I don't know how helpful the dense and sparse terminology is at the first when you first see it, I'm going to present you two examples on throughput data. And this is going to be throughput data from three locations on the network. So the dense anomaly that we detect is this one here. And again, we are actually seeing we're preempting it before it goes massively wrong. But this is an example of this hugely wrong behaviour is broadly similar across the three locations and happens at the same time. So this is an example of a dense anomaly. It's going wrong. A sort of a stripe, if you will, a stripe of anomalous behaviour. Whereas a sparse anomaly is it goes wrong. Again, we're preempting this one, which is cool. It goes wrong in two series to different degrees, but it hasn't gone wrong in this series. This series here is still acceptable for that day we're monitoring there. So this is just an example of where it doesn't need to all go wrong at every location. If it does, fine, we'll detect it. But we can still monitor the other locations individually. To give you some idea of how it happens. I don't want to dip into the maths too much as to be brutally honest, it's not finished. So I don't want to offer any deception that it's better than it actually is. What we fit is previously a single equation, single ordinary differential equation, whereas now we fit a system of ODEs and that captures the behaviour of multiple locations and that linkage will it link it linked <laughs> linked relationship between the full and um, this ODE system is then applied to a new observation, and that new observation, I mean a new data at all those different locations, to produce a set of residual functions. So it really is like fast, but multiple variants, like variants, high dimensional fast, if you like. And what we see is we have a two stage test statistic, and it's going to simultaneously monitor individual locations given this ODE system and all the locations, the cumulative behaviour of every location, to identify both sparse and dense anomalies. So over time, I'm monitoring each individual location, see if one or a small number have gone wrong. And I'm also monitoring the combined behaviour by adding it all up, by taking the cumulative, if you like, sort of test statistic. And that gives me the idea of the dense anomalies. 
to be able to detect both sparse and dense anomalies in real time, if you like, as the data is observed. And just to close the presentation off, I just want to show you some of the weird and wacky things that sort of looking at it from a multivariate point of view can actually let you do. Because you can have data that looks like this, that's sort of a, a helix emerging over time. So we've got two dimensions going over time. So rather than this one dimensional curve, we've got some sort of helix structure, helical maybe, structure emerging. And we see we can pick out anomalies in that. And these actually would be quite hard to get just by looking at the one dimension separately. So we can actually look at a whole manner of data sets that are emerging, I suppose, in time and space if you really want to. And they can help us detect all sorts of abnormal things. So what I hope I've shown you through the multiple underlying shapes and also the weird and wacky helix kind of thing is that, yes, FAST needs a single underlying shape and we're going to detect deviations from it. But hey, it can actually potentially work in a whole host of situations where it doesn't quite look like a single underlying shape. So it's applicable in a wide variety of cases, although perhaps niche, if you've, unless you work with helixes all the time. Um, so yeah, to conclude, we've shown that throughput data can be modelled using data-driven differential equations and then tested for anomalies. I presented FAST to you and I show it in action on simulated data and BT data, including throughput data from Collindale and the VCDN data as well. And we've shown that FAST can be extended to situations with multiple underlying shapes, and I've provided some tentative early work exploring FAST at multiple locations or over multiple dimensions like the helix. So thank you very much for listening. Um, are there any questions?